This is Wally Knox. Welcome to The Political Conversation. In 1997, globalization mania and neoliberalism was reaching a high crest. President Bill Clinton put it this way, The global economy is giving more of our own people and billions around the world the chance to work and live and raise their families with dignity. The American people have made our passage into the global information age and era of great American renewal. One thinker pushed back and in 1997 published a book with the title, Has Globalization Gone Too Far? His name was Danny Roderick, and he went on to foresee the globalization without limits, what he called hyper-globalization, would fail to bring its promised benefits and would breed a powerful political backlash in the United States and Europe. He foresaw that globalization without limits meant that American workers were pitted in impossible competition against workers around the globe who earned a few dollars a day rather than 20 and 30 dollars an hour. He foresaw that many American workers, with their pay cut, their future bleak, their kids looking forward to more of the same, and despised by the thriving college-educated new elites, These workers would rebel against the political establishment and elect a spokesperson, a tribune, who would voice their rage. But in the 1990s and early 2000s, Roderick was largely a lonely voice, dissenting from the voices of globalization and its supporting theory, neoliberalism, which dominated the media and both political parties. But a change was coming. I first met Roderick in the winter of 2016, shortly after Donald Trump's astonishing election to the presidency. When I walked into his office at the Kennedy School at Harvard, he was on the phone with a journalist who was seeking some words of wisdom, perhaps some consolation, to explain how a guy like Trump possibly could have succeeded. Suddenly, Danny Roderick was sought after. But I didn't invite Roderick on the political conversation to review his work of decades past, establishing the flaws in hyperglobalization. I invited him because he recently posted a provocative article which began with this intriguing statement. A new economic paradigm becomes truly established when even its purported opponents start to see the world through its lens. He then laid out a summary of three successive economic paradigms. Keynesianism during the era from FDR's 1930s to Ronald Reagan's 1980s, followed by neoliberalism from Reagan through Barack Obama, and a possible successor to neoliberalism that he calls productivism. In the 1990s, Danny Roderick looked ahead a quarter century and nailed it. Now I'm curious, just what does he mean by a paradigm? What are the elements of the three paradigms he sees? And is his proposed new paradigm, productivism, one that we should embrace? Today, Danny Roderick is professor of international political economy at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and is president of the International Economic Association. Danny Roderick, welcome to The Political Conversation. Thank you, Wally. Nice to be with you. Could you begin by walking us into your thinking and explain just what it is in general that you mean by a paradigm? Well, a paradigm is is really a a general um, uh, motivating vision of what our economic order should look like. Uh, It's generally rooted in certain intellectual ideas about how the economy works and how it could work better. Uh, I think most fundamentally it has a particular view of the role of collective action or public action or the role of government. And uh, in the introduction, you mentioned um, three different uh, paradigms. Um, I might go back a little bit in history and and also mention mercantilism, for example, as an alternative paradigm um, that uh, really predated uh, the era of, of laissez-faire and industrial revolution. And so when Adam Smith, back in 1776, uh, wrote his magnum opus, The Wealth of Nations, um, he was really arguing against mercantilism, uh, which was the dominant paradigm of the day. And mercantilism viewed um, the economy largely as an instrument of the state. 
um, and uh, uh, trade as a means to accumulate uh, gold. And um, Adam Smith uh, objected to those ideas and uh, formulated um, some of the key concepts that underpinned the transition towards uh, freer markets um, and a liberal market economy, which uh, since the 18th century has evolved and taken different forms, but that was a, a, a fundamental paradigmatic change. So I think every paradigm has a, a, a set of fundamentally important and probably universal and valid ideas. Um, and uh, it is complemented with um, a lot of uh, other thoughts and, and views, which probably are, um, if they were ever right, they were right for a particular period for a particular set of countries and, and don't really work. Um, uh, I sometimes say that by the time that we, you know, we reach a conventional wisdom or something becomes paradigm, it's almost definitely is, is wrong because it's full of so shortcuts and and, um, and generalizations that is probably not useful. Um, so mercantilism, uh, you know, which is, has been much derided, obviously, you know, had a number of important insights uh, that you needed the um, state direction to undertake significant uh, um, uh, structural transformations in the economy that this doesn't just happen on its own by the private interest of, of uh, uh, um, investors or, 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 or in uh, commercial enterprises. Um, and Adam Smith's paradigm has a number of enduring insights that the markets can do a lot of wonderful things uh, in the absence of the state. And sometimes you want to let markets do their job. And of course, neoliberalism in some sense um, was the um, apogee of uh, uh, market-based uh, thinking that took it in a particular direction. Um, and that's sort of the area that that we're coming out of. Can you sketch then and contrast, let, let's just turn to your your ideas about uh, the failures of neoliberalism and what kind of paradigm could now begin to emerge, what you call productivism, and, and in the course of that contrast the, the outlooks of the two paradigms. I think what has come to be called neoliberalism, or sometimes, you know, I call it market fundamentalism, um, is is the view that um, is, first of all, we need to understand where it came from, because every paradigm is in large sense, is, it gains credence uh, because of the failures of uh, the paradigm that preceded it. So it's important to understand where neoliberalism came from. It came from the apparent failures of uh, um, the sort of the Keynesian welfare state arrangements. Um, of by the 1970s, that this was a period of um, uh, high inflation. Uh, this was a period when um, uh, um, the, the, the standard Keynesian macroeconomic policies didn't seem to um, have a solution uh, to the problems of wage cost spiral um, of the late 1970s, um, where the state uh, seemed to be overexpanded and, and sort of the private sector seemed to be sort of losing its vitality. So there was a kind of a, a, a sort of neoliberalism with its central message that you have to liberalize and let the market do its job and stabilize, get, you know, sort of the, the state and the taxes low and then uh, globalize, let the global economy uh, integrate into the global economy so it can take advantage of uh, the, the global division of labor. Um, and privatize and get rid of these public enterprises. So that, you know, sort of, you know, seemed to offer a, a message um, that, uh, um, that that could produce a, a, a better outcome. And, and I, I think the, the basic problem with the sort of succession of paradigms is that, you know, the pendulum swings in from one extreme to another. So one um, dimension of this is the you know, the, the balance between the market and the state. I think all economic history, including economic theory, teaches us that, um, you know, markets require states um, and states cannot uh, prosper uh, without healthy markets. So there's a complementarity between markets and states that markets, economies perform well when there is a good 
balance between markets and states. Never when, you know, sort of you give markets um, too much power or you give uh, the state too much power. And and I worry that that this sort of uh, movement, you know, historically has been always that we tend to overshoot. Um, so if mercantilism and in some respects the Keynesian welfare state uh, gave the state too much of a role. Uh, we had probably too many public enterprises. We were probably too ambitious uh, in terms of macro managing and micro managing our economy. Um, tax rates were probably too high at the margin in a lot of different settings. Uh, by the same token, I think when we got to sort of neoliberalism, uh, we forgot the important stabilizing role and equalizing role uh, that the state uh, could play. So, uh, you know, I think when I discuss productivism as, po- you know, potentially the next uh, paradigm, uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that, uh, that, that, that we're able to uh, achieve two things. One is that we have a better and a, and a more enduring balance uh, between markets and the state. Understand this complementarity, that it's not market or the state, it's market and the state. Uh, but that this is not simply at the national level or the federal level. A lot of this cooperation uh, between firms and employers and private investors um, and collective organizations, whether it is local governments or local civil society organizations or or non-governmental organizations, a lot of that has to happen at the local level. Um, So number one is getting a better balance and number two is is sort of avoiding these pitfall of uh, becoming a a kind of a a cookie cutter blueprint um, that um, resorts to easy generalizations and therefore very quickly loses its relevance uh, to actual context so being able to apply and think about these principles in a way that's very sensitive to local context and the needs of the moment. So that's that's the hard thing. And it's, it's, it's not clear to me that's, that you can have a paradigm uh, which is sufficiently flexible, because if you tell people, well, you have to do a lot of the thinking yourself, a lot of the ideas have to be developed on the ground, a lot of it has to rely on local experimentation. Well, you know, people will, well, but you're not telling us what to do. You're just telling us nothing. Um, and, and so I think there is a danger here. And that's why I'm, I'm myself of two minds, whether I want to push a paradigm or not. I mean, I want to push for a certain way of doing things. But if that goes too far into being overly prescriptive about what these experiments or what these local collaborations in creating good jobs, in creating local investments might look like, then then we're going to replicate the errors of the past. I was thinking when you were describing... uh neoliberalism, what uh, what I experienced. I was in the state legislature in California for a number of years and saw myself as a liberal Democrat who wanted to help working people. Um, but all the ideas that were discussed and that, that I came up with really came out of the neoliberal paradigm. And it was a cookie cutter uh, approach at that point. The slogan was kind of, uh, for every market problem, there is a market solution. Um, and whatever direction you turned, you would find a market way to, to deal with it. Um, so it was, here we were, liberal Democrats dominating a legislature in thrall to a set of ideas we didn't even realize were ideas. They seemed like common sense. Yeah, so I think, you know, I, we clearly the, ma- the most important challenges we're facing are those that are re- going to require significant amounts of collective action and that we cannot simply leave to markets. So I think the first most important um, uh, challenge we face is the threat to our physical environment. Uh, that is, of course, the climate uh, change challenge, the climate transition. This, I think, even the most uh, orthodox and conservative art economist understands is not a uh, a problem that can be left to markets alone. Um, and that's going to require public policies. And we understand that these public policies now go significantly beyond simply raising the price of carbon, that is the carbon taxation. I think most economists now understand that uh, it is obviously desirable to raise the price of carbon so that consumers you know, pay the full social price 
of emitting uh, carbon into the atmosphere, but that you need to complement that with significant public investments in new technologies, in green technologies. And that's essentially sort of the kind of step that the um, uh, the new um, Inflation Reduction Act of President Biden has started, but the big part of it is is uh, is, is you know public investment um, to address climate change. The second existential challenge I think that we face is is the one to our social uh, environment, to our social fabric, and that's the challenge of creating good jobs, uh, you know, creating an employment structure that gives people at the low end of the wage and skill and education uh, distribution a way into the middle class. And that also is is a problem that um, markets left on their own cannot solve because essentially we now have had 40, 50 years of technological change and globalization that has hollowed out the middle class, um, that has uh, created too few good jobs for people um, and and the middle class has collapsed uh, globally within countries, uh, most notably in the United States, where the protections and the role of the state has been weakest. So I think we need a, a set of concerted uh, policies, uh, partly based on training, but that goes beyond training, uh, policies towards firms, policies that in the old time used to be called industrial policies. Uh, but strategies of working with innovators and with investors and with producers focused on uh, creating uh, good jobs for um, uh, the, um, the the less advantageous members of, of the labor force. And that again is an area where I think this productivist um, a set of ideas can make a contribution to. So, you know, if we think about the climate change um, uh, challenge and the good jobs challenges are is in some ways our, our uh, most important uh, short to medium term uh, uh, challenges. Both of them require, I think, significant, uh, going significantly beyond uh, just sort of decentralized private initiative and markets. Could we stop at this point and could I, could I ask you to, to think of specific, more much more specific examples of the kinds of programs that might flesh out what you've just been discussing? Um, for instance, the, the cooperation between businesses and educational institutions in um, creating creating really good jobs with really good workers what are you what are you thinking of there so our our, our focus on uh, in good jobs has um, been mostly on providing um, uh, workers with training whether it's through workforce uh, development programs or through community colleges investing in training and I think that's without question that's um, a, a uh, an important part uh, of of the equation, but training is not enough. We also need to work directly with firms in order to um, to uh, engage with them and uh, get them to pro produce the right kinds of jobs for the types of workers that exist in their localities. So, to give us a, a specific example, I mean we have very successful um, workforce development programs uh, such as Project Quest uh, in San Antonio or the, um, you know, the Jewish Vocational Services here or in Boston. And one thing that we've learned about how, why these um, uh, training programs are successful is that um, uh, in their language, they have essentially a du dual client approach, which is that they don't work, their only client isn't the workers that they're training. They also have a second client, which is the firms. So I think we need this cross-sectoral engagement. Working with firms is important, not just so you, you can understand what the needs of work, what the needs of firms are, so you can engage in the right kind of training. So you're, you know, you're providing if they want training in a particular healthcare mm -hmm. facility or particular IT training, that you're providing these through your training facilities or in your community colleges. 
But it's also important because developing this longer term relationship and trust with firms can allow you to alter the employment and human resources practices of the firms themselves. So, um, so the more successful of these workforce development agencies are able to work with firms to adjust their essentially labor demand, the type of workers that they're looking for, their human resource classifications, so that they can work with these local agencies to provide the kinds of jobs that are more suitable, uh, while also serving their own needs in terms of enhancing productivity. So this kind of engagement of firms, understanding their needs, but building on that, developing an ongoing relationship so that you can eventually extract also soft commitments on their part to, to, uh, to generate and supply the kinds of jobs that are needed is, uh, is also an equally critical component of that. Now, in the United States, um, you know, our economic, local economic development agencies uh, do not typically work with the training agencies. They work quite separately in terms of trying to attract firms or trying to retrain firm, re- retain firms. So we need that kind of a cross-sectoral collaboration between training on the one hand and working with the needs of firms on the other in order to do this better. And I think successful examples uh, do that. So those are in terms of, of, of um, programs at the local level where we can build on existing models but scale them up. But we also need, I think, efforts at the national level um, that we need to understand that we need, we need to invest in technologies that are much more geared uh, towards um, the parts of the labor market where less highly educated workers are going to find themselves in and to increase directly their productivity. Um, as you know, most of the change in technology and innovation in the last 40 years have benefited uh, people with the greatest skills, uh, people with graduate degrees or the professionals. I don't think that is destiny, that is that technology can be given a direction. Uh, So it doesn't have to be what economists call skill bias necessarily. It doesn't have to benefit necessarily mostly. So if you look at our, you know, where most of our employment is going to be generated in a country like the United States, it's going to be in healthcare, it's going to be in education, it's going to be in retail, it's going to be in services, uh, mostly local and domestic. And we need to think much more about how we can make the types of workers that are going to be employed in those services much more productive. And instead, I think a lot of our thinking on technology and innovation focuses on semiconductors, on you know competing with China. Um, you know, those might be you know worthwhile objectives. But just as we think about green technologies and investing in green technologies or we think about investing in military technologies for national defense and security. We need to have national innovation programs uh, that uh, think of um, sort of uh, early stage technologies that are worker friendly. I I just read your your second piece, sort of a follow up piece on, you had one piece that introduced your productivism idea and then you almost immediately produced another piece on fleshing it out and responding. And I read it and it appeared to me to be a fairly direct response to some of the programs that Biden has succeeded in, in initiating and getting through. Um, your art, and allow me to distill it, your, your article uh, urged that we not be fixated on competition with China and use that as a talisman for what we're doing. Uh, that we not focus on manufacturing and, and move into the services area and and the point you just made that in general we need to think that technology uh, can do things other than enhance the ability of college graduates to earn even more money. It can help help other people. Uh, it sounded to me like a, a fairly direct response to um, the Competition Act with China, the chips manufacturing bill, which is again China and manufacturing. Um, s- I'm not asking you <laughs> whether you meant it as a direct response to what everyone sees as a political success for the president, but 
it certainly sounded to me like your thoughts are that this is an these these ideas need to be injected into the political dialogue. Someone needs to be asking these questions at the political level. What about uh, workers who don't have college degrees? What about the fact that manufacturing simply doesn't have the number of jobs it it needed before? What about what about? Um, how should how would you characterize it? No, I think I think that's right. I mean, I, I think these new programs and the Chips Act and the um, uh, the the sort of the you know public investments in in, in green uh, uh, technologies and so forth, uh, those are partly the background against which I'm talking about the emergence of a new paradigm. Because what's notable. Uh, about these efforts is not that you know Democrats are once again willing to think about these public initiatives. So they're moving they're moving away uh, from uh, sort of um, where the party was under Clinton, let's say. Um, but it's that they're able to pass these uh, bills uh, because there are enough Republicans uh, that want to go uh, you know, that want to be on board. Uh, so that there is also convergence from the right on some of these ideas. So, you know, so I was writing my first piece was really a kind of to say that, um, look, you know, whether you like it or not, and whether I approve it or not, there is something brewing out there that's connecting, you know, both sides of the political spectrum around the set of issues. And here are sort of what, what's together. It's, it's much more focused on, you know, jobs, it's on community development, it's much less focused on uh, globalization, it's more concerned about the health of local economies, um, it understands the role of public capacity in the states, uh, it's, you know, tends to be more skeptical about the role of large corporations and, and so forth. Um, but also, I, I, you know, I was a bit concerned, I mean, my you know, caveat to all of this, uh, it's, it's a large footnote, if you will, maybe it's part of, should be part of the main text, uh, is that I see uh, these efforts as being overly, overly optimistic in terms of how many birds can be killed with one stone. So I think there is the sense that uh, you can, you know, um, you can, you know, you can do the climate transition and you can fight, uh, you know, sort of, China on the geopolitical front, and you know, create a you know sort of uh, you know you know a, a good jobs economy, all through the same kinds of tools, and and I'm concerned that that is not the case. That in particular, that the kinds of industrial policy that uh, you might in, embark on in reaction to China, uh, focused on manufacturing innovation, focused on semiconductors, uh, focused on exports, uh, is not uh, where the jobs are going to be created. Uh, these are some of the least labor-intensive sectors of the economy, particularly for the kind of workers that we really want to do the most for. Um, and so I'm, I'm concerned that if we don't have industrial policies or policies or public uh, institutions that are or technology programs, uh, that are specifically targeting uh, a good jobs economy and what's happening in um, left behind uh, regions and distressed parts of the economy, uh, that we are going to be disappointed. Um, and so I think that's the, the, the point that I, that I want to make, that we need a different types of industrial policy. We don't need different types of technology and innovation programs. We need to focus much more on services, uh, we need to focus much less on China. Um, we need to focus on much less on top-down prog programs and much more on local collaborative efforts, because that's really what's going to pay off. If you're thinking about how do I create, how do I shore up my middle class and bring bring some some of the social and political, um, uh, 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 you know, sort of you know, our society back together. It's, uh, it's remarkable to me that the debate so often is phrased in terms of competition with China. Uh, and then in order to compete with China, programs that essentially are manufacturing are proposed. Well, manufacturing employment in China has peaked 
and is literally uh, declining. Their overall manufacturing output continues to increase for the same reason that ours does. People are more productive. We produce more per worker. But the number of workers China is employing in the manufacturing sector is going down month by month by month. Um, so your observation about services uh, dovetails perfectly with the idea that, look, if, we're, if we are going to ser take seriously a, a, some kind of a competition with China, whether it's hot or cold or whatever, uh, we need to rethink the, the focus on manufacturing as the only place where good work exists, the only place where a family can say, I could, I could build on this. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, you know, if, you, if, if what is the best that we could do is in manufacturing would be to actually manage a significant increase in the share of manufacturing output as a share of GDP, um, let's say at constant prices. And we look around the world, you know, we find examples like South Korea or Taiwan in recent decades have continued to increase the shares of manufacturing in GDP at constant prices. Um, but that's for output. You look at what has happened to employment in these cases. Even in the most successful cases, in these global champions of uh, manufacturing, um, employment as a share of total labor force is steadily declining. Um, and these two are, are part of the picture of the productivity picture, as you're saying, that, that part of the reason why these countries have been so successful is by increasing um, labor productivity. And they are using fewer and fewer workers. Now, you know, that's fine. I think manufacturing probably will always play an outsized role in our economy because of its role as a source of innovation and its spillovers to the rest of the economy. But we need to understand that that's not where the bulk of the jobs are going to come from. I mean, manufacturing now employs, you know, uh, around 8% of the workforce in the United States. It's very difficult, even under the best of circumstances, we can get it above 10%. Uh, and that will be sort of working very hard against the wind uh, if these industrial policy programs are successful. So we will, you know, still need to find, you know, the bulk of jobs are going to happen elsewhere. So we need to think about, uh, you know, small, medium-sized firms. We need to think about sectors like healthcare and education and retail and other kinds of services. We need to think about how we can transform these into good jobs. And part of it is going to be through having, you know, better local and national standards for bargaining, for representation, for hours. Uh, health uh, and safety regulations, but part of it is also going to be through increase and thinking about how we can increase the productivity of workers in those sectors by providing them with digital tools, by providing them with the ability to perform customized tasks, uh, by providing you know ways where we can achieve better dignity, enhanced dignity, and enhanced enjoyment and career ladder opportunities so that you know people do their jobs more efficiently more productively um and and so i think it has to that's sort of an important agenda which uh, i think is, is currently being largely overlooked have you thought about the role that you and the, the academy in general you in specific the academy in general can play in disseminating these ideas beyond the academy um, I, I think you're absolutely right. It isn't just a federal government issue. The kinds of things you're discussing are so inherently local in so many ways. We have a, here in California and throughout the country, there's a vast community college system that I spent years working in that cares about the kinds of issues you're talking about a great deal. Um, and there are people within that community who would happily embrace every word you're saying. Uh, and, and move on it. Um, ha have you thought about how you would just overtly begin spreading those ideas? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think we have started actually a, a program uh, at Harvard uh, with funding from the Hewlett Foundation um, to basically, first of all, start by learning from these local uh, um, practitioner communities because I've been struck by how much of um, sort of our, 
you know, some of our theorizing by economists and academics and others who have been thinking about industrial policy lately, how much of that is actually has already been in practice uh, by, you know, sort of you know, local workforce development agencies, by local economic, economic development agencies, by local coalitions of various stakeholders um, who are facing very sort of, you know, day-to-day, very practical problems of how to create jobs in their own local community and how to revitalize their local economy. So they've been inventing these tools on their own without help from from academia or, or, or research. So I think there's actually a lot of, you know, sort of practice that we can learn from. And what we as academics can do is um, is is built on this practice and and identify sort of what works, what doesn't work, what are some of the common elements, what is general, what is contextual, what are the things to look out for, and I think you know that might help uh, legitimize and scale up and build better and uh, practice um, over time. So I think you know sort of I'm very keen on. On, on, on this interaction between sort of um, the, the world of practitioners and the world of, of thought leaders and academics. And I think, um, uh, you know, we, we, we are trying very hard to get into the minds of the practitioners right now, trying to figure out what is it that they're actually doing? What is it that they're doing? And we need new academic research tools also for this because it's not quite clear the kinds of quantitative research tools that economists tend to use are very good for this. Um, you know, quantitative tools might be good to understand, you know, do tax incentives work or not? You know, you know, uh, but if you want to understand how local coalitions are built, where these, you know, coalitions of stakeholders come from, when they can be effective, when not, uh, you know, sort of what is in the mind of these local practitioners, how they work, then you need to do very different qualitative, almost ethnographic kind of work which is very uncomfortable for, for economists. But I think that's the kind of work that we'll need to get into. I couldn't agree more. Uh, let, me, let me point out one of, uh, I spent seven years on the college board of a very large community college system here in, in Los Angeles. And you're absolutely right. There are people in that community who literally would agree with every word you said and have struggled <laughs> within the system to begin to do the kinds of things you're talking about and with some success. But here's my observation that it, as one person who comes from within that system would offer to you and to uh, other folks, and that is this, a lot of those measures where they worked were because of extraordinary talent that one or another community college person or administrator had. It was very much dependent on the drive, the will, the insight of a very particular, usually somewhat charismatic individual who forced the issue. And I saw time after time, those programs really worked. But to replicate them was very difficult because the key elements were not the numbers, as you were sort of alluding to, were not the statistics and the this and the that. It was that talent that passion. Um, so my thought is this. I don't mean that as a thing to be glossed over. I mean it as a serious observation. How do you begin to think about that? Uh, we, could, we, could, we have maybe hundreds of those people throughout the country today. What you're talking about is having hundreds of thousands of those people throughout the nation. And that's a very serious national endeavor. Um, and I'd urge, I just, for one person, I'd urge you to continue to think about how to achieve that. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's it's a very interesting and tough question, um, sort of what makes for lack of scaling up or emulation. So if it were the case that this, these successful programs where they exist really hinge on extraordinary ability or talent or charisma, and that's really what makes them impossible to scale up or emulate. It would be a very, you know, sort of um, uh, dispiriting conclusion. Uh, I'm not ready to accept that yet. Uh, I do accept that uh, you do need exceptional uh, individuals, um, but that exceptional individuals exist by definition <laughs> almost everywhere. So what do we mean by an exceptional individual? Somebody is in the, you know, you know, 
hundredth percentile, uh, let's say 99.9 percentile of the talent distribution or the charisma distribution in any every local community. Well, you know, that means even a community of 10,000 people has a hundred of those. <laughs> and we don't have all of that. We don't need all of them to be sort of local economic development uh, types. But, you know, if we get two or three of them to work at this, then we'll still achieve a lot. So, uh, but, you know, we don't, the, the, the truth is we don't know how much of it is driven by history, how much of it is driven by the structure of uh, community as it, as it exists, the nature of community relations. Part of what we're trying to do is to really understand uh, what in that ecosystem uh, uh, contributes to this um, beyond individual talent. Well, also your idea of the, the paradigms. You're pointing out that the, the whole collection of individual programs, individual proposals, individual this and individual this, were buttressed and flowed from and were justified by overarching values, overarching principles that basically everyone came to agree with as normal and obvious uh, plays a big role in that because the individuals I'm talking about needed to be extraordinary because they were in a milieu of neoliberalism. They had to fight to get their ideas put forward. If there is, if you could, you know, if the country goes through a paradigm change, they aren't alone. They aren't alone. They have friends. They have allies. And they don't need to explain their ideas over and over and over again to poor, ignorant people on community college boards. No, that's absolutely critical. I mean, you know, uh, Keynes had this uh, nice uh, uh, saying that, that even the most practical of men are the slaves of some you know, long dead defunct economist. Um, and so the ideas in the air matter hugely in terms of what people do and how they behave, even if they're not very conscious of it. So I think by having different ideas in the air uh, can also can be very both liberating and empowering uh, to do things in a different kind of way. And I think that's um, that's something that certainly uh, academics and, and, and uh, intellectuals and, and, and uh, public commentators can, can do. So here's an idea that, uh, that I have wanted to, I've been looking forward to discussing this with you because uh, I think you're, Quite frankly, I think the kind of work you're doing, whether anyone agrees with every single thing you are talking about or not, is exactly what the country needs to do. We need to be debating these ideas. We need to be wrestling with these ideas. And that's the most important contribution I think you and other folks are making. But but here's the big question. You, you see these ideas as a bridge between the left and the right. They're both talking about business. They're talking about good businesses. They're talking about good jobs. And so it seems that there could be a bridge between left and right. But I worry that from a political point of view, the politics could work against you for obvious reasons. And I've been curious to hear what your reaction would be to this question. On the right, it's easy to see your ideas as rejected because it's just too big. It's too much government involvement. It's so easy to fall back on conservative cliches about the dangers of that. On the left, your ideas can be seen as too overtly interested in the middle class. Uh, we should be concerned about woke issues. We should be concerned about the poor. Um, if you'll indulge me in another personal anecdote, I was in the state legislature for a number of years as a liberal Democrat, but a liberal Democrat who urged the party to have a middle class agenda. And I vividly remember being screamed at by a prominent Democratic leader that that was completely wrong and that uh, the Democratic Party should be concerned with the poor and the, and if you'll pardon my language, the effing middle class can take care of its effing self. And it was, you know, that was the, a very common outlook. So the, the danger of being the bridge between the left and the right is that you can be neither accepted by the left or the right. 
Well, that's always a possibility, and that's why I'm not in politics. I'm very happy to say, uh, but I, I think it. I mean, it is. This is a war of ideas, and I think um, you know, uh, um, and, and 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 there are ways of presenting the case that might appeal to important segments of both the right and the left. I think the important thing is for um, the Democrats to understand that um, as much as the U.S. system of uh, safety nets and social protection and social programs, as much as they can be bolstered, um, you know, the U.S. falls far short of what the standards of a welfare state by the standards of the Western Europe, for example, would look like. As much as we have work to do there in terms of providing for you know better safety nets and, and where we're really lacking is in terms of thinking about again productivist policies, which is not simply transfer income to people uh, and provide for better social insurance, but actually create meaningful job opportunities, productive job opportunities for people, because ultimately that's how you address poverty. Uh, is by creating job ladders, productive paths for people out of poverty, not um, by um, um, you know simply more transfers and and more um, more social uh, policies. So I think that's something that the uh, the uh, uh, progressives and 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 the Democratic Party has to understand that this is an imp- a critically important path. Uh, forward that you know that as we move away from um, the uh, sort of the traditional Keynesian welfare state arrangements of the past, um, that we need to move much more in the direction of working on the production, investment, innovation side of the picture, so that we're creating uh, these paths of uh, productive transformation from poverty into the middle class. And so, no, I don't care particularly about the middle class either, in, except in the sense that if we don't care, if we don't take care of the middle class, uh, then we're not creating positions, paths into the middle class for the people at the very bottom, for the poor, right? So that's the thing. We want people in the bottom to be, to be able to have paths into the middle class. And if we're not taking care of the middle class, that's not going to happen because the middle class will shrink just as a, as a mathematical impossibility. Um, for the right, I think, you know, I would appeal um, to their sort of, you know, simple political interest of being electability, right? I mean, it's it's sort of, it's responding to the economic and social needs of their communities. And that's going to require them being much more proactive and thinking in terms of collective action and the role of the public uh, uh, sector in what it can do. Um, you know, Several years ago, uh, the journalist James Fallows and his wife went around the country in a, in a single engine plane studying these kinds of local, um, you know, collaborative arrangements to v- revitalize communities and so forth. And he was struck by how it didn't matter whether the local government was run by the Republicans or was run by the Democrats, you know, when you're facing a common problem, which is joblessness or disappearing jobs or the factories moving away, uh, you know, as practical, you know, women and men, you're drawn into a set of strategies of saying, how can you sort of, you know, create better jobs and, and pull, this, pull the community back together? And those kinds of pragmatic, practical strategies don't necessarily, you know, come with a kind of a political affiliation of whether it's right wing or left wing, it's Republican versus Democrat. So I think there, there, I think there is a path um, that might connect both sides of the spectrum. On the other hand, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to be Pollyannaish. I mean, you know, it's, it's much of the Republican Party right now is, uh, is is someplace where um, is, I mean, I don't know exactly how to describe it. It's, you know, crazy. You find, be, you find the words yeah. and tell the rest of us, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally uh, um, uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, for much of the Republican Party, any, so anything sort of reasonable sense, reasonably sensible along the lines that I'm describing is, 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 a, is a jump too far.
Yes, but uh, there's so much in the traditional conservative business-oriented Republican Party um, that might prick up its ears and listen. You know, we're, we're living in an era where some of the best arguments for a new industrial policy are being made by Marco Rubio. Or people like Orrin Cass. Yes. So it's interesting to see that develop. Thanks for coming on the political conversation. And uh, I look forward to wrestling with the, your ideas as they, as they develop and as they enter the public mainstream and generate debate. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to, to talk to you. In the brief time since I interviewed Roderick, I've noticed a wide variety of commentators voicing much the same concern. Here, for one example, is Rana Faruhar writing an op-ed in the New York Times. I'm going to quote her at length. Quote, Every economy goes through cycles of expansion and contraction, but the most important indicator within those cycles has less to do with market prices or unemployment rates and more to do with underlying political philosophy. For roughly half a century, our political economy has been based on the governing concept of neoliberalism, the idea that capital, goods, and people should be able to cross borders in search of the most productive and profitable returns. Fortunately, the pendulum of the political economy eventually swings back, and philosophies that have outlived their usefulness give way to new ones. Seismic shifts in the socioeconomic agenda are rare and transformative. We are going through such a shift now. The world is beginning to reset, not to the normal of conventional neoliberal economic models, but to a new normal. There is a rethink going on in policy circles, business, and academia about what the right balance is between global and local. And that's the end of the quote. She's written a new book, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World, this describes her recommended shift from globalization to locating work that creates prosperity in our homelands in much greater detail. You'll notice that Faruhar focuses on the global versus local concern. Roderick agrees with the importance of building successful local economies, but always weighs deeply into an expanded role for government. In other words, there really is an emerging debate about the shape of the new consensus. And that is a very good thing, just what we need at this time. Do you remember also Roderick's observation that an economic paradigm is revealed as well-established when even political figures we might assume are hostile to the paradigm start seeing the world through its lens? Well, the right wing of U.S. politics is beginning to show some signs of picking up on the need to move beyond neoliberalism. There is a Republican senator from Arkansas named Tom Cotton, who is a bona fide, anti-big government, staunch conservative. This guy recently submitted proposed legislation which would establish a nationwide apprenticeship program with requirements such as structured on-the-job work with coordinated career training, all of which would be administered under the Federal Department of Commerce. About as far from neoliberal orthodoxy as you can get, so far, these are just straws in the wind. We have yet to see either political party make a concerted effort to build such proposals into their program. At this moment, just weeks before the 2022 national election, the parties seem content to debate abortion rights, inflation, crime, sexual identity, gun control, anything other than how to restore the American middle class. Nonetheless, we are a long way from President Bill Clinton's neoliberal rah-rah view that, quote, the global economy is giving more of our own people and billions around the world the chance to work and live and raise their families with dignity, end quote. Roderick is right. We are living in the formative period of a new paradigm. The future consensus will certainly be built around rejection of the excesses of neoliberalism but its positive composition is up for grabs. Looking back, I have just had conversations with three remarkable theorists, David Otter, Duran Osamoglu, and Danny Roderick. For those three, 
how to obtain widely and democratically shared prosperity, call it earned equality, is central to their work. That project, How We as a Nation Will Earn Our Equality, will remain the work of this podcast. My thanks to Danny Roderick for our conversation and to my producer, Anna Kumu, for her excellent work. My next conversation will be with Brad DeLong, author of Slouching Toward Utopia, which is an economic history of the period from the 1870s through the catastrophe of the Great Recession of 2008. You can always reach me at wally at thepoliticalconversation.org with your comments, your agreements, your disagreements, and even your rants, along with recommendations for future guests. I'll see you next time on The Political Conversation.